Hi folks, welcome back to Coffee with Ravi. Uh, today we have a special guest. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Glasscock. Dr. Glasscock, uh, uh, or Dan as I refer to him, uh, is a long-standing native of Cedar Falls area. In addition, uh, he is a regional uh, medical director, vice president of Unity Point Clinic and does a lot of work uh, supporting uh, medical infrastructure for all of us in the community. He's been, in general, a friend to us and friend to the practice and uh, has had a lot of experience. At the outset of COVID, uh, he conducted a daily morning conference for all the medical providers in this area, which was uniquely helpful for us as we manage COVID. I know a lot of you have requested us to talk about long haul COVID or uh, long COVID or PASC as it's known. And I thought uh, Dan would be uh, 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 excellent resource for that because he's had experience, he practices medicine, he knows this COVID area well, and he's in, been in general in the outpatient arena uh, being our go-to for COVID. So welcome, Dan, and thank you. Um, thank you very much. Very yeah. nice to be with you today. Thank you. So I think a lot of our patients ask us about long COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what are the mechanisms? Uh, who's at risk for long COVID? Uh, and I guess the other thing we wanted to touch on is what are the options and what are the resources available for them in our community. So sure, please take it away. Well, so a lot of the symptoms of, of long COVID are similar to the symptoms of just having COVID. So some of the chest pains and shortness of breath and, and chronic cough and, and things like that. There's a few other things that are kind of a little more unique to, to the long standing COVID. Um, some of those things are the brain fog that you hear so much about. Uh, chronic fatigue is a real common problem for a lot of people. Uh, chronic cough, chronic shortness of breath, uh, dyspnea with exertion are all, all real common. Um, we're, we're coming to learn as time goes on that, that different strains of the virus may be a little bit more prevalent for certain types of post-COVID symptoms or, or long-haul symptoms. Such as? Uh, the, the alpha variant, the first variant that came through, uh, seems like brain fog was a lot more prevalent in that than, than the Delta variant and, and the Omicron variant. Um, so that's some of the research that they're doing now or looking into. Uh, also with the Alpha uh, variant, there's more problems with uh, chronic muscle pain and, and uh, anxiety actually was one of the common symptoms of long haul COVID uh, in that variant. And so we're seeing that there is, is potentially some difference, differences in long haul symptoms uh, depending on what, what strain you had. And of course, we're you know we're not really testing anybody for their specific strains. They're they're doing that at a at a state hygienic lab mm -hmm. level just to see what what are the common variants. But it's never getting traced back to the patient, so you never really know which one you have. Uh, you you just kind of presume that if you had it recently, it was probably Omicron because that's the most prevalent thing right now. Mm -hmm. So you know the the, the symptoms of, of uh, long haul COVID are, are quite variable. Are there patients that are more at risk? Other than on the virus side, on the patient side, are there some people who are more at risk for long haul? Uh, some of the things that they're finding in, in the research now are, are that middle-aged people uh, seem to be a little bit more at risk. People that have underlying medical conditions like asthma are probably more uh, susceptible to having long, long haul symptoms. Um, some research also suggests that women may be a little more, bit more likely to have post-COVID symptoms. And is the virus still persisting or what's the mechanism? Is it deconditioning? Is it damage? Uh, what, what, what's happening inside the body? At, at that point, the, the, the virus should be pretty well cleared. Well, cleared. Uh, okay. so, so it's an inflammatory response of some sort. Uh, and I don't think we have a, a real thorough understanding of what causes post-COVID. So. If people take antivirals uh, or uh, any of the antibodies, do they become less prone? To, uh, I think er earlier, if you get if you get ahead of it, uh, I think you're less likely to have post-COVID mm -hmm. symptoms. And of course, you know, at early on we were not treating everybody mm -hmm. uh, because we just didn't have access to monoclonal antibodies for everybody that had COVID. So that was really just given to people that were at highest risk of, of having, you know, bad acute outcomes. Uh, so I, I think, um, you know, as as time goes on and we learn more about this, uh, we may be a little bit more proactive about treating as many people as we can. Um, you know, young, healthy people are generally told to go home and, and rest and push fluids and, and do all the things you do for a, for a regular cold if they don't have severe symptoms. Uh, so maybe we need to be a little bit more proactive about treating uh, more people as we have the ability to, to do so. Mm -hmm. And if, if 
in general perhaps if vaccination and if they get mild disease maybe uh, do you feel that they would be less prone to long covid if they're vaccinated I, I, yeah i do think that some of the research is now showing that that if you are vaccinated you're going to have hopefully less severe symptoms i mean all the literature supports that that if you're fully vaccinated and boosted uh, you know, the symptoms you're going to have if you get COVID are going to be milder, much less uh, likelihood of ending up in the hospital, much lower likelihood of, of dying from COVID. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we're, as we have more experience with this, we're also finding that people that have been vaccinated and, and have less, less severe acute symptoms are also less likely to have the long haul symptoms. Mm -hmm. So the two groups of long, I mean, long haul symptoms, one is this brain fog, just kind of all of that aspect. Mm -hmm. What are options and how long should they, people expect that to last? Is it temporary? Is it, we don't Well, I, I, I think that, you know, we certainly have people that, that have ongoing symptoms uh, for over a year. Uh, so that's, you know, very, very worrisome. Uh, roughly a third of people that, that have COVID are gonna have some sort of symptoms that, that persist at least a month. Um, but but uh, some of the things like the brain fog, uh, we, we are seeing that that generally improves a little bit slowly with time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, most people are getting back to their baseline, mm -hmm. but it's, it's oftentimes taking months or, or even over a year uh, to, to get there, so. Any medicines that could be helpful or um, antidepressants? For, 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 any? for brain fog, I, I think there's a lot of research going on for what, what op treatment options there may be, but I don't think there's anything that's so, really well vetted yet. Yeah. And, and so we just have to work with, we just have to be patient with Being it. patient and, and giving it time. Uh, some of the other things, you know, some of the, uh, well, you know, the shortness of breath and things like yeah. that. Um, you know, I, I think there's probably some options with, um, you know, pulmonary rehab and, mm -hmm. and that type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have one, one patient uh, who's a, a college athlete that had COVID last summer and has struggled with post-COVID symptoms, particularly shortness of breath and easy, easily fatigue. Um, you know, he can he can do his sport for about a minute and a half at a time, and then he has to take a take a rest. And so, you know, this is a, a young, healthy person that you would think would be able to bounce back uh, quite readily. So there's really no predicting who's going to get it, uh, which is why we think it's really important that people get their vaccines, vaccines and and, yeah. and do what they can to to avoid you know large gatherings and things like that. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that that is still changing as time goes on. So, mm -hmm. you know, I'm sitting two feet from you and we don't have masks on, true, true. but we're, we're both vaccinated yes. and I feel comfortable doing that. But, yeah. um, but there's certainly, you know, a, a, lot of, a lot of the population that hasn't been vaccinated. So it's gonna be prevalent in the, in the population for the foreseeable future. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and just unfortunately no way of predicting uh, absolutely who's gonna get long haul symptoms. Yeah. Uh -huh. So really you're saying prevention as much as I mean, vaccination crowd precautions, masking and bigger, you know, following, you know, mask guidance if you're, mm -hmm. uh, uh, what about the the other last aspect is the GI side effect and the low blood pressure GI side, some of this long COVID stuff, mm -hmm. is that's also we're managing symptomatically at this point. Pretty right? much, yep. yeah. Yep. So if eating smaller meals, uh, maybe mm -hmm. trying to do more rehab, more pushing mm -hmm. yourself. So no quick fix for- uh, No, uh, there, there's not right now. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's a tincture of time, as they say, but um, certainly for, for people that have chronic diarrhea, you know, you can, you can try uh, you know, low modal and medications like that, just to try to manage symptoms. Um, but as far as a, a cure or a quick fix for it, there's really nothing going on right now. So then going forth into uh, the immediate future, going back to uh, uh, acute or more immediate COVID infection, uh, in our community now going into, let's say if the cases do go up perhaps because of the new variant, et cetera, uh, Omicron mm -hmm. variant, uh, what are resources for antivirals or antibodies should they um, should what, what's our guidance uh, to our patients on that? And certainly encourage people to get into their primary care, primary uh, care. so that yeah. so that we can direct um, you know towards getting uh, the antivirals or, or uh, monoclonal antibodies that, as we have uh, available. Yeah. Um, Is there more availability now? Uh, well, right now that's one of the problems with the Omicron variant. You know, we were using this. Uh, um, uh, bamlanivimab uh, monoclonal antibody uh, for the earlier variants and, and that was we had uh, you know good access to that uh, but uh, with the omicron variant it was not susceptible to that so there's 
uh, only a, a couple of other uh, monoclonal antibodies that, that uh, would be beneficial, and the access to that was very limited. So, you know, for for a little while, we we really had we had to be very selective with who we could even get uh, to, to get monoclonal antibodies, and that was just the highest risk patients that were most likely to have bad outcomes. So, uh, you know, the the most recent Omicron. Uh, variant has kind of has kind of come down, but we're starting to see a spike of a, a, a new one. Mm -hmm. And so right now, I don't think we know for sure what's going to be the most uh, effective um, treatment for it. Not and not and the availability then would be based on what the treatments would be then. Correct. At that point. That's that's the thing about the, this whole pandemic that, that that we need to keep in mind is that this this is a, a moving target constantly. Mm -hmm. So we we need to continue to to research, and we have to pay attention to the research. Uh, and um, you know, as as time goes on, we will, you know, we we are able to look at everything retrospectively quite nicely, and, and and try to decide well, what could we have done different? What could we have done better? But as we see these new variants, uh, and they are less susceptible to certain treatments or more susceptible to other treatments, uh, we don't know that until we can actually do the research on it. Yeah. I know Unity Point has been quite active in, in this COVID field as Unity Point as a whole across the state or across the region. Uh, any uh, uh, Unity, what are Unity Point's main focus areas then on, on COVID? Uh, can you speak to that? Sure, I, I think our main focus is just trying to get people vaccinated. I, I think ultimately that, that's important. Uh, we do know that as, as the, the numbers ebb and flow, uh, you know, right right now, wearing masks out in public has, you know, we're, we're not required to do that in the state anymore. Uh, we still encourage it, but trying to convince people to wear a mask when they don't have to is, is a challenge. So prevention is the big thing. Right. But inside Unity Point facilities, Allen Hospital oh, yeah. or Unity Point clinics, masking is still uh, uh, requested. It, it's, yeah, it still is. Um, you know, there, there was uh, some guidelines that came out from, from OSHA that basically said that healthcare, uh, uh, healthcare organizations you know, basically mandated or we had to have masks. Now I think OSHA has backed off on that a little bit. And so uh, there's probably going to be a time sometime in the future where uh, we are looking at the prevalence in the community, we're looking at the, the positivity rate on the testing and so forth, and, and taking a look at you know, what, what is the likelihood of uh, you know, contracting COVID uh, in, in a given facility. Our urgent care facilities, certainly, you know, that they see a lot of patients and a lot of those are coming in with COVID type symptoms. So the, the potential exposure there is a lot higher uh, risk than it is, you know, for somebody going to an orthopedics clinic where people are going there with their ortho concerns and not coming in with their colds and flus. So uh, we'll, we'll have to take a look at, uh, you know, several different factors. And as time goes on, I suspect that we'll, you know, back off on mask uh, requirements. Uh, it'll still be, I think, recommended for a lot of people. Uh, but at some places like urgent care, where we see a real high prevalence of people coming in that have active symptoms, you know, they'll probably be wearing masks for the foreseeable future. Last question, if patients have COVID symptoms, which Unity Point urgent cares can they go to? Which locations can they go to? Uh, right now, the, the uh, United Medical Park is is not seeing patients. Uh, they've, they've been kind of designated a, a testing center for pre-op and that, that type of thing. Uh, but all the other locations, uh, so San Marnin, um, uh, North Crossing uh, by the hospital, uh, up in Waverly, uh, down in Marshalltown. And then we just, uh, we moved our uh, Prairie Parkway uh, urgent care out of the Prairie Parkway building and put that just down the road, uh, right on, um, right on Viking Road. So they can go to any of these. They can go to any Unity of those. Point. These are yep. Unity Point uh, urgent cares. Yeah, urgent cares or express Expresses. express cares. That, that in these locations. Um, but certainly, we're, we are also doing. I, I do testing in my clinic all the time, so patients can come in. And, and of course, if we have patients coming in that we are suspicious or they have symptoms, uh, then we're you know, masking and putting on gowns and, and uh, putting on face shields and everything uh, just because of the higher risk for exposure because we're trying to protect our, our providers and staff as well. Well, thank you. I think this was very uniquely uh, informative. So if you have questions, as always, email and I'll funnel them through Dr. Glasscock and get, get you back the answers. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Thanks.